Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Zaria. I am the Growth Marketing Coordinator here at Higher Level. Super excited to have John with us from Sandberg Phoenix. Um, our topic today is employment law updates. So we're just super excited. Um, we do apologize in advance. Um, we apologize for the rescheduling of this webinar. Things kind of happen, um, technology, and we all kind of know how that plays out. Um, but before we get started, um, I do want to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar will last less than an hour. Um, everyone on the call is in listen-only mode, but you do have the ability to put questions in the chat. Um, as you come up with questions, go ahead and put them in the chat, and at the end of the webinar, we'll have some time to answer all of those questions. So before we get started, I just want to introduce John. So John has been practicing law since 1975. John Gilbert brings a wealth of experiences representing small to mid-sized companies to the firm's Edwardsville office. John is a member of the business, business litigation, and health law practice groups and focuses on his practice on labor and employment law, commercial and higher education law, as well as civil rights, defense, and correctional medicine. John serves as a team leader of the correctional medicine industry team at Sandberg Phoenix. When working with clients, John dives his head in first, getting to know all about the client, their business, and the environment in which they operate in. He is dedicated to first listening to his clients and working with them collaboratively to help achieve their goals. John's hobby is reading, and especially mystery novels and academy publications about ethics and business. John began his career as an assistant general counsel and acting general counsel at the office of general counsel of Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville before moving into private practice. During this time, he advised clients and tried cases that included First Amendment claims, civil rights, employment law claims, unfair labor practices, arbitration, probate, commercial litigation, and other matters relating to his area of practice. Since 1983, John has held an appointment of as, as an assistant attorney of Madison's County, Illinois. As a former member of the Illinois Civil Rights Service Commission from 1978 to 91, John served as a lecturer in management and marketing at Southern Illinois University of Edwardsville. A, a position he held from 1985 to 2020, teaching courses in business ethic, business law, cyber law, and labor employment law. John is a certified sexual harassment prevention trainer as well. Thank you everyone again. And John, I pass it off to you. Thank you very much uh, and welcome everybody. I'm very grateful for those of you who uh, hung with us after we had to reschedule uh, and I'll uh, get started because we don't have a lot of time and as most of you know an hour goes pretty quickly. So uh, one of the major issues that I wanted to address this morning uh, that is a hot issue in employment law in the state of Illinois certainly it, and I, I, we've been getting tons of questions about this and I think a lot of, for a lot of employers, it's a lot more, maybe we've made it more difficult than it really is. And that's the uh, Paid Leave for All Workers Act of the state of Illinois. Uh, it's found at, um, well, it's, it's Public Act 102-1143. Uh, it took effect in January. And it essentially provides that all employers, with the exception of park districts and school districts, they're not covered by this act, uh, provides for 40 hours of paid leave in a 12 month period. And the feature, the other feature that it has that makes it somewhat unique is that it's paid leave for any reason or no reason at all. And the employee who is invoking the leave need not give a reason uh, for the taking the time off. 
They don't have to tell. <clears throat> now, if as an employer, you have a policy that allows already, or at least as of January 1st, 2024, if you already have a leave policy that accommodates an employee taking 40 hours in a 12 month period, for any reason or no reason at all, the advice from the Department of Illinois Department of Labor is that you don't need to change your policy. Now, I don't know that I, as a practitioner, completely agree with that because the statute and the, the proposed regulations are rife with notice requirements and communications to the employee to let employees know exactly what your policies are. So I think it's worth re-examining if you haven't already, what your leave policies are in order to uh, comply with the, with the statute. Now the Illinois Department of Labor came out with, or issued, I should say, proposed rules some time ago. And just this morning, I heard that the joint committee is set to approve the rules. Uh, you can get a copy of those rules on the website and I'll give you a web address in a little bit where you can get as much information as you want about the uh, Paid Leave for All Workers Act. Uh, the department is very good about cooperating with employers to help us comply with the act. So let me talk a little bit more though about what's in the act. So we know that it's 40 hours of paid leave in any 12 month period for any reason or no reason at all. And the employee does not have to give the employer a reason. <clears throat> now, there, there's also a section in the statute that if an employer is covered by a local ordinance uh, with that contains at a minimum, the standards in the statute itself, then um, those govern. So essentially, if you live in a municipality that has enacted a paid leave for all workers act ordinance, if you will, or a county ordinance, then that governs not the statute, but essentially you're complying with the statute by virtue of that. Um, as I indicated, <clears throat> school districts and park districts are exempt. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a nasty virus. Uh, and one of the issues that came up uh, was, or is, what about remote employees? I mean, clearly, employees who work in Illinois or employers who have a presence in Illinois are covered. But the issue came up, what about remote employees? And the department's position on remote employees is that if the employee's primary work is in Illinois or if the employer does business in Illinois, the employer is covered by the Paid Leave for All Workers Act. So again, you need to examine your leave policies to make sure you're in compliance uh, and obtain legal counsel if necessary. And by the way, I need to mention that um, the, this webinar uh, is not for the purpose of providing you legal advice, uh, but is to bring to your attention these issues that are on the agenda for today. And I would encourage all of you to consult your own legal counsel or of course, hire me uh, so that you can get appropriate advice and compliance for compliance with this law and the myriad of employment and labor laws that the state of Illinois uh, has enacted and continues to enact as time goes on. All right, so that's remote employees. Now, according to the regulations uh, in the statute, there are two methods by which you can provide these 40 hours in a 12 month period of uh, paid leave for all workers. There's 
something called the accrual method. Now, the accrual method uh, is a method that is best suited for part-time, seasonal, and temporary employees. And the way the accrual method works under the statute and the regulations, which again, are soon to become, uh, in a, become effective, is that it's one hour of paid leave for every 40 hours worked. And, it, and, and again, this is suited for uh, part-time, seasonal, or, um, oops, sorry, part-time, seasonal, or temporary workers because as they work, and as soon as they hit 40 hours, then they get an hour of leave. And again, for any reason or no reason at all, and they don't have to tell you. For full-time employees, <clears throat> the statute and the regulations recognize what the department describes as front-loading. Front-loading is where at the beginning of each 12-month period, the employer says, here's the 40 hours that you have available that complies with the statute. And this is designed for regular full-time employees so that at the beginning of the 12-month period, the 40 hours is there. Now, you may already have it under your PTO policies or under your vacation or other leave policies. <coughs> and uh, the, the, the important part about the front-loading method is that it cannot be reduced and you can't recoup it uh, under any circumstances. It belongs to the employee. And unlike the accrual method, it's earned up front and you can't take it away. You can't prorate it. It belongs to the employee. Uh, now, uh, well, I'm, uh, actually, you can prorate it uh, for uh, on the accrual method, so long as you follow the ratios of the hours worked to 40 hours. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the issues that came up in the discussion on the regulations was what about exempt employees? Exempt employees who don't get overtime. Uh, after 40 hours in a week, what if they work overtime? You know, do they under, even though under the FLSA, they don't get overtime, will they continue to accrue one hour for every 40 hours worked over uh, 40 hours? And the answer is no. Uh, the statute and the regulations reflect that exempt employees are capped at 40 hours a week. So they don't earn anything additional uh, once they've either been front loaded, which would be more likely the method for uh, a full time employee who's exempt. Uh, the, so, as if they work overtime, not only are they exempt under FLSA, but they also don't accrue any more paid leave under this statute. Now, um, now that we've passed April 1st, 2024, the provision about uh, leave uh, could be used 90 days after the statute took effect, which would be, was January 1. So as of April 1, uh, employees can use the paid leave under the paid leave for all workers act. <clears throat> and, you know, we were able to postpone it for 90 days. Um, and the rule still is that it's not available unless you make it available for 90 days following date of hire. Now, the regulations make clear that there's only one 90 day period. 
So at the beginning of each 12 month period for which the leave is credited to the employee, there's not a new 90 day period that starts where the employee can't use it. There's only one. So when you hire an employee for the first 90 days, they are not entitled to, to request and use this leave, but there's only one of those. In the next 12 month period, there's not such a restriction. <clears throat> now, all of us who are involved in representing employers uh, know or have to face, how does an employee request the leave? And currently, uh, an employee who wishes to utilize this leave must request it within seven days or seven days prior to the leave if the leave is foreseeable, sort of like the uh, FMLA. If the leave is foreseeable under this statute, uh, the employee must uh, ask for seven days in advance. If not, then it's as soon as practicable. Now, that could also, I think, include if they use the leave for an emergency, uh, which of course they don't have to tell you why they're using it, <clears throat> but if it's an emergency and they come back and say, hey, I was gone Monday, charge that to my uh, PLAWA leave. Now, uh, one of the features of the statute is that employees can use this leave, these 40 hours, prior to any other kind of leave, sick leave, vacation, FMLA, VESA, whatever leave the employee is entitled to, they, the statute and the regulations provide, or the rules, I should say, provide that the employee can use this leave before invoking any other type of leave. Now, one of the issues that have come up, of course, is, and this is covered in the statute and the rules, and that is, when can you deny the leave. Uh, when a request is made to use the leave, when can you deny it? And I can be able to deny it forever, but in the particular circumstance in which the employee comes forward and says, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I want to use this leave, uh, the regulations in the statute provide for the ability of the employer to deny it for that particular time period. Now, two major issues here. One is you have to have a written policy that is disclosed to the employee that provides the conditions under which you can deny the leave, which are spelled out in the regulations. Um, the basic uh, reason for denying leave at a particular time that it's requested is described as uh, the, the core operating needs of the employer. So let me tell you what those core operating needs um, are um, com comprised of. So if you're gonna deny it, The regulations provide that a denial can, may be based on operational needs. And there's a list of factors that the department will look at to determine whether or not the employer had a legitimate basis for denying the leave. And those are, uh, and they're not exhaustive, but these are the factors that are contained in the proposed rules. Number one, whether the employer provides a need or service critical to the health, safety, or welfare of the people of Illinois. So here you're thinking first responders, um, 
people who, who are employees for perhaps um, water departments, uh, you know, services that are critical to the health, safety, or welfare of the citizens. And whether similarly situated employees are treated the same for the purpose of reviewing, approving, and denying paid leave. So again, that's sort of a non-discrimination factor that's looked at when you go to deny the leave. And these are not or, this is and, whether granting leave during a particular time period would significantly impact the business operations due to the size of the employer. So, you know, what these are not, this isn't surprising when the standard is operating needs. You can't just say, hey, I got to deny this leave because we need you. These are statutory or these are factors in the in the rules that the department's going to look at if somebody files a complaint if they are denied leave. And the fourth element is <clears throat> whether the employee has adequate opportunity <coughs> to use all paid leave time to which they're entitled over a 12 month period. So that's what the department is going to be looking at if you deny leave. And frankly, these are factors that should be worked into your policies so that when, in a, when you have a situation where you have to deny leave, you can assess these factors with respect to that particular employee for whom you want to deny leave versus an employee who uh, you might not be denying leave to. So you have to uh, be sure that you focus on these factors if you're going to deny this leave for a particular time period that is sought by the um, by the employee. Uh, and of course, uh, the, 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 there's a requirement that you provide to the employee a record of each request which is denied and the reasons for the denial. Uh, and again, it's very clear the department's position is you have to provide written notice of your paid leave policy, um, which you'll see in the statute and also in the regulations. Uh, the statute, by the way, you might want to write this down, is at 820 ILCS, Illinois Compiled Statutes, section 192 slash 15, well, well, section 192. So that's where you'll find the statute, uh, which has a lot of detail, but the regulations, which are the rules, I mean, which are about to be approved, um, you can find on the website for the department. And they have a specific website for um, for this, for this act. And I have it here somewhere. Uh, I mean, you can easily go to the Illinois Department of Labor website and navigate that. It's, but this one specifically is at paid leave, one word, paid leave at illinois.gov. That's paid leave at illinois.gov. There you'll find the statute, the proposed rules, which again, as I indicated, are about to become approved uh, and they have uh, a very, the department itself is very cooperative when it comes to giving guidance to employers under this act. So I would not discourage you from uh, interfacing with the departments uh, to get guidance under the statute. <clears throat> now, one of the questions that comes up and is dealt with by the statute and the rules is um, carryover. What's the situation with carryover if an employee doesn't use these, the time that they've earned, whether it's front loaded or accrued in the, in the uh, 12 month period, 
can they carry over? <clears throat> and the answer is, if you're on the accrual method, where employees earn one hour for every 40 hours worked, um, then yes, they can carry it over up to a cap of 80 hours. They cannot carry over more than 80 hours. And that's under the accrual method. If you front load, where the employee gets the 40 hours at the beginning of the 12 month period, if they don't use it, they lose it. There's no carryover because the entire 40 hours is made available to them at the beginning of the 12 month period. So the regulations provide the rules. I keep calling them regulations, but the rules provide that there's no carryover if you front load. So, you know, there's a, uh, an incentive uh, to front load. Now, if you're doing accrual, then yes, employees can carry over up to 80 hours, a cap of 80 hours of unused uh, leave under the statute. Now, one of the questions every employer is going to have is what happens on separation when the employee leaves? <clears throat> or if the employee leaves. And you know, we grapple with this under the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act all the time. So, uh, but under this statute, <clears throat> you may have to pay out, or you may not have to pay out, depending upon if you segregate this leave from other types of leave. So if you create a paid leave for all workers act leave of 40 hours, <clears throat> then when the, and you front load it, especially, then when the employee leaves, you do not have to pay out any accrued leave under the paid leave for all workers act. And the same would be true even in the accrual method, so long as you separate this leave from other types of leave. So there is an incentive to carve out PLAWA leave from the rest of your leave policy. Now, is it gonna be an administrative burden? Of course, but uh, if you want to not have to pay out any of the unused leave under this statute, when an employee separates, <clears throat> then you have to segregate this leave from your other vacation, sick leave, other PTO, personal days, et cetera. Uh, but, that's the way you can avoid having to pay out unused PLAWA leave upon the separation of an employee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, there are record keeping requirements that you know I don't need to go into here. Uh, the, the record keeping requirements are found at section 20 of the statute. Uh, and there are regulations. The rules also address the record keeping. Uh, suffice it to say that if you're an Illinois employer, you are familiar with the extent and nature of records that have to be kept. And for this statute, no different. They're spelled out in the statute and the regs. So I would recommend you to those. <clears throat> Finally, the statute has, uh, not unexpectedly, anti-retaliation provisions. You cannot retaliate against employees for seeking this leave, for using the leave, and of course, for not uh, telling you why uh, they want to use the leave. Because <clears throat> again, this leave is 40 hours of paid leave for any reason, no reason at all. You can't ask why they want to use this leave, and they don't have to tell you, unlike FMLA or other types of leave that are provided by statute, um, both state and federal. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I, do, I think that once you gain a, an understanding of what the statute and the rules provide, complying with the statute, um, should not be that difficult. 
other than the administrative aspect, but understanding it, knowing what it requires and applying it, uh, I think um, should be um, not as difficult as we thought when the act was first proposed and as it went through the various stages in the General Assembly, and then once it became law. So, uh, and again, I would heartily recommend that if you have questions, check with your legal counsel, but also check with the Department of Illinois Department of Labor. This website, they have all sorts of resources to help employers. So I would not hesitate to take advantage of those. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So that's the big deal under Illinois law. By the way, there's another statute that takes effect in July <laughs> that you should be aware of. I apologize. Uh, on July 1st, a statute that you know has not gotten much attention takes effect. It's called the Freelance Workers Protection Act. And it basically provides for <clears throat> protection for independent contractors who are natural persons. So if you hire a company to provide independent contracting services to you for whatever the services might be, this act does not apply. It applies to independent contractors who are natural persons that you hire to do a particular service uh, for you. And the statute uh, provides protections for these folks uh, in terms of you have to have a written agreement. The statute talks about what's in the written agreement or what has to be in the written agreement. You know, payments requirements. Uh, and so this is an act that you should probably take a look at. Again, it's called the Freelance Workers Protection Act. Uh, I recently did a short blog on it on the Sandberg Phoenix website uh, at sandbergphoenix.com. Uh, and also it's on our social media that gives a brief outline and a, and a citation to the statute. So uh, that's one you ought to take a look at if you employ independent contractors who are natural persons, not contracting through a corporation or a partnership or a other type of business entity. <laughs> All right. Uh, now let's turn, I wanna turn for a, the remainder of our time to some of the things that are going on at the federal level with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, if you're an employer in Illinois, you probably know that the National Labor Relations Board is pretty aggressively um, taking steps to protect the rights of workers in the workplace. Now, of course, the NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act applies primarily to private employers, and you don't have to be unionized to come under the statute. There are the protections under the National Labor Relations Act extend to employees of private employers, whether you have a union or not. And many employers are surprised to find that out because you can still be hauled before the labor board pursuant to an unfair labor practice charge, even if your employees are not organized or particular employees are not organized. So the Biden board, has become very aggressive in its pro-employee approach to the workplace and to employers who run under the jurisdiction of the NLRA. And what the Biden board has done is reverse 
uh, several of the Trump board policies that tried to strike a a, 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 at least in their view, a better balance between the interests of employers and the interests of employees, <clears throat> while still recognizing that the labor board exists to protect the rights of employees under Section 7 of the Act. You know, to organize, to bargain collectively, to take uh, concerted action and all the things that are protected under Section 7. But uh, what we're seeing is uh, when the when President Obama was in office, his board began to uh, become much more aggressive in the protection of rights of employees and much less concerned about the interests of employers. During the Trump administration, we began to see what at least his board believed was a more balanced approach. And that generated several cases that became precedent, which we're now seeing the Biden board reversing and going back to Obama era or Obama board precedent. Uh, and, you know, this is a, a constant battle between the interests of employees and the interests of employers, depending upon who's in the White House. Uh, and so we've seen much more aggressive uh, cases and policies decided by the, Obama, the Biden board now, uh, and who knows where that's gonna be after November. But there are, couple of cases that I wanted to bring to your attention as employers that are of concern, that are major changes in the way the National Labor Relations Board approaches uh, matters under its jurisdiction. <coughs> the first is a case that was decided uh, last year. All of these pretty much were cases decided in the last half of 2023. And the first one I want to mention to you is a case called CEMEX, C-E-M-E-X, um, which is a decision of the board that dealt with, um, actually this decision was last August, and it dealt with uh, elections. When uh, the employees in the workplace, private employers, um, decide they want to seek representation by uh, an exclusive bargaining representative, a union, uh, and the board has adopted a new approach to this, new representation rules. What the board has effectively done, in my opinion, is move to essentially what we refer to as card check. Uh, <clears throat> card check, and Illinois has this under the Illinois Labor Relations Act, Public Labor Relations Act, that governs uh, labor relations in the public sector in our state. Uh, and card check simply means that if you have a majority of the members of the proposed bargaining unit who sign authorization cards, then the employer has to recognize the union as the exclusive bargaining agent. And in a sense, that's what CMEX has done, in my judgment anyway. So that when a majority of employees in a proposed bargaining unit presents the employer with uh, authorization cards to be represented by that union, the employer has, according to CMEX, three choices. One is you recognize the union. End of story, the union is recognized, the board certifies it, and you're off to collective bargaining. 
The other option is for the employer to immediately file an RM petition. <coughs> Excuse me. That is a species of representation of a <coughs> representation petition where the employer basically says to the labor board, look, I've been presented with this, but I want to be sure that my employees can exercise their right of self-determination. So I want an election. This is where the employer seeks an election. So that's the other option. Either recognize them or you file immediately an RM petition so that uh, the employer can assure itself that the employees actually want to vote for this. The third is uh, to await the processing of the uh, what is called the RC petition, which is what the union files in conjunction with presenting the employer with a majority of signed authorization cards. I should say signed authorization cards by a majority of the employees in the proposed collective bargaining unit. And then you can wait. Now, if you don't do, if the employer doesn't either accept the union or file an RM petition, then the board takes the position that that constitutes an unfair labor practice. And if you lose on the unfair labor practice charge, you get what's called a remedial bargaining order, which means that you're forced to bargain. No election, you're forced to bargain. Now, also, if while you wait for an RC petition, to be processed, uh, or during the RM position that you have asked for as the employer, the danger there is if there's any unfair labor practice committed, you wind up automatically with a remedial bargain, bargaining order, which means you have to bargain without knowing whether or not the majority of employees actually want the union. So, what the board has done, in my judgment anyway, practically is bind the employer if a union comes forward with, a, with, a, with signed authorization cards from a majority of employees in that proposed unit. That's essentially what this does, in my view. Uh, and again, remember, I'm a management side lawyer, so I might take a little more cynical view of what the Labor Board is doing here than others. But I think what they've done and their intent is to make it easier for unions to be recognized as exclusive bargaining agents in the workplace for a private employer. Uh, <clears throat> so you really need guidance when this, if this happens in your workplace. You need to go immediately to your labor council and get advice on how to handle this to protect yourself because it is a trap for the unwary and it's a minefield even for those of us who know how to do it. Uh, so word to the wise on the CMEX case and the general counsel of the labor board uh, is very aggressive in uh, asserting the protection of rights of employees, even though, as you'll hear in the next case, I want to talk about the board got its ears pinned back uh, on going overboard, uh, which is not infrequent. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> the next case I want to mention to you is the Tesla case. Uh, there are several. Tesla cases in front of the Labor Board, but this one made it to the Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. This was a case in which Tesla required its, Tesla at its manufacturing plant, this particular one 
was in Fremont, California. Tesla requires its employees to wear uniforms on the production line to minimize damage to vehicles as they make their way through the assembly line. So uh, the some of the employees at this production plant wore union t-shirts instead of the uh, uniforms that Tesla required to ensure that there's no damage to the vehicles as they're processed through the assembly line. Now, Tesla did not have a, uh, a ban on union clothing or union insignias other than on the assembly line in order to avoid damage to vehicles that were being assembled. Well, the NLRB decided that uh, by doing this, Tesla violated the Section 7 rights of its employees. In general, unless you have a legitimate business reason, employees are entitled to wear union insignias, T-shirts, buttons, et cetera, uh, <clears throat> in the workplace. But if there's a legitimate business reason or a special circumstance that uh, suggest that they ought not be able to do that, then employers can prohibit it. Well, in the Tesla case, this particular Tesla case, the NLRB took the decision that uh, when you have a uniform policy that in this case prohibited the union mem uh, members from wearing union insignias and the union t-shirt, instead of the uniform that was required for the assembly line, that uh, this was, well, the board said, when an employer interferes in any way at all with an employee's right to display union insignias, the employer must prove special circumstances to justify its interference, which is a heightened burden for employees to, employers to meet, as opposed to just balancing of the employee's interest versus the employer's interest. So in other words, the court said what the board had done here was make uh, all uniform requirements uh, presumptively invalid and subject to the special circumstances test. And the court said, no, that's wrong, that the board erred in doing that. So that the court said, in, when you have a decision, when you have a decision by an employer that interferes with the employee's right to wear a union insignia, no matter what it is, that the board has to balance the interests that the employee is asserting and that the employer asserts for that requirement or for that prohibition of union insignia, as opposed to the prohibition being presumptively invalid and then putting the burden on the employer to prove special circumstances for the rule. So the Fifth Circuit says, <clears throat> yep, we're gonna go back to the test of balancing the interests of the employer and the employee, which the board now has to do. So it remanded the case back to the board. And my guess is the board's still gonna say Tesla was wrong, but uh, at least they now have to follow the Fifth Circuit's decision, at least in the Fifth Circuit, that a balancing of the interests is what has to be done, not special circumstances. So that's one where the employer was successful and the board kind of uh, got put back in a more reasonable posture. Another case that uh, I wanted to bring to your attention, again, the, it's an NLRB case. It's called Metro Health. Now, Metro Health is a board decision that is on appeal 
Uh, it was decided September 20th, or 30th, excuse me, of 2023. And it has to deal with the never ending issue of what's the legal situation when you contract out work, especially work that may have either been done by the bargaining unit or could be done by a bargaining unit. Okay. So in Metro Health, um, the importance of this decision is that the board has taken the position that decisional bargaining is required unless there is a special contract provision that allows it or there's a clear and unmistakable waiver of bargaining over the decision to contract out. Now, if you have, if you're an employer that has, uh, that has an organized workplace, you know that if you decide to contract out work, at a minimum, you have to bargain over the effects of contracting out that work on the members of the collective bargaining unit. So you have to bargain over the effects of that. So if you're gonna contract that work and people in the bargaining unit <clears throat> might be laid off, then you have to bargain over, you know, are you gonna have income protection? Are you gonna give them benefits to get educated? You know, are you gonna do nothing? You know, you have, but you have to bargain with the union over the effects of that contracting out. There was always an issue of when do you have to bargain over the decision to contract out? Not the effects, but the actual management decision to contract out that work. And in Metro Health, the, um, the board says that decisional bargaining is required unless there's a specific contract provision that addresses it and relieves the employer from having to bargain over the decision, or there's a specific waiver in the collective bargaining agreement, clear and unmistakable waiver of decisional bargaining over contracting out. <clears throat> this is a change because the board is now saying the presumption is you have to bargain over the decision, which wasn't the situation before. And now the burden's on the employer to show that there is a specific contract provision allowing it or that it's been waived through a clear and unmistakable waiver, which essentially means what the board's gonna be looking for is hey, if we decide to contract out, we agree, no decisional bargaining. And how often are you gonna find that? Um, so, you know, this is, this is a change that you have to be um, mindful of. And again, get legal advice if you have this situation arise in your workplace. Now, there's another case that I wanted to bring to your attention. I know we're getting short on time. Uh, the Stericycle case, S-T-E-R-I-C-Y-C-L-E, an August 2nd, 2023 decision by the board, which again is on appeal, but uh, basically the board announced uh, a standard for how, to, how, to, how they judge workplace personnel policy and whether or not they interfere with Section 7 rights of employees to whom they apply. And the board has decided that it went back to a standard that if a reasonable employee could interpret a work rule, which includes your basic personnel rules that we've lived with for generations, if an employee could reasonably interpret the rule to interfere with Section 7 rights, then uh, the burden shifts to the employer to show that the rule advances a legitimate and substantial business interest and that the employer is unable to do it any other way, essentially. 
And what makes this decision even more troublesome is that <clears throat> the board is going to look at the coercive potential of the rule from not only the perspective of a reasonable employee, but from the standpoint of the employee who works for an employer, which is everybody, that has a measure of economic power over that employee, which makes the test even more difficult for employers than it was before. So this too is one where you have to be concerned about uh, and get advice on because this is the kind of case where you don't have to have an employee in a union to file an unfair labor practice charge over the impact of a work rule or an employee personnel policy uh, that applies to that employee. So the stereocycle case is an important case in terms of the authority of employers to implement standard personnel policies in many cases, uh, which could end up being a violation of the National Labor Relations Act, unless this case is uh, reversed or modified on appeal. So this is another uh, minefield for employers just in the everyday implementation of personnel policy. Uh, if an employee feels uh, that it's coercive with respect to their section seven rights. Uh, so again, these are complicated decisions by the board on which you need advice. Um, we're running out of time, but I do wanna tell you about a recent decision by the board uh, just to let you know that the board now takes the position. This isn't a decision. This was a memorandum from the general counsel of the board, uh, Jennifer Abruzzo, who is a very aggressive advocate uh, when it comes to advancing Section 7 rights, uh, sometimes over the top, in my view. Uh, and they now, she's now taking the position that moonlighting policies, in other words, policies where you prohibit employees from taking jobs, uh, other jobs outside of the workplace, likely violate Section 7. So be on the lookout for claims like that, that your employees who work for you, but then they have another job outside of work, and a lot of people have second jobs. If you have a prohibition on that, or you have conditions on that, the NLRB is looking for you. So that's another area in which you need to get sound legal advice uh, to navigate this minefield that we're seeing uh, coming pretty aggressively from the National Labor Relations Board. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we only have three minutes left, essentially, but if anybody has questions, uh, please feel free and I'll do the best I can to answer them. I know this is a lot, uh, and it's just the tip of the iceberg, honestly. Uh, we could do this all day. So thank you for your attention, and I want to thank Higher Level again for enabling me to uh, present to you, uh, and I got to give a plug to Higher Level. They're awesome uh, and do take advantage of their services. They're the best in the business. Thank Thanks you so much, John. Well, that was, that was awesome. Thank you so much. We do have a couple of questions in here. I'll Good. read them for you. So it says um, from Julie, she said, our company has allowed more, has always allowed more than 40 hours of vacation for our full-time employees. And we don't question the reason for the leave. We will now provide up to 40 hours of leave for our part-time and seasonal employees in accordance with this act. Do we need to create a vacation bank of 40 hours for all employees and records for this act? Essentially creating two vacation banks for the full-time employees that can earn more than 40 hours. 
Okay. My quick answer to that is I don't think you do. However, if you do, you can then prohibit carryover for employees who are front loaded. So there is some value in that, but no, according to the advice I have gotten from the Department of Labor, you do not need to do that. Awesome. And then um, Angela Tripp said, in Illinois under the Paid Leave for All Workers Act, if an employee works less than the 90 day probation period and was never able to opt to use this PTO they accrued, do we still need to pay it out upon termination? Not this, not the leave under the paid leave for all workers act. No, I don't believe so. We still have a few more minutes. Does anyone else have any more questions? Okay. Now, let me again reiterate, talk to your legal counsel on these issues, but you know, that's my, as my, one of my partners used to say, my curbstone opinion. Gotcha. Kim Lawson says, we are a Texas company, so I'm assuming that none of this pertains to us. Unless you do business in Illinois and you have employees who work in Illinois, then it does apply to you. That's all I'm seeing so far. I do have a question of my own, John. Um, so you know, obviously the higher level team has just been working with our clients um, to really get them set up on like, you know, the right PTO tracking, you know, reviewing their um, current plans. And I guess kind of like, how have you, um, since this act took place, like how have you seen employers kind of reacting to this as far as um, just reevaluating what they have going on and um, putting a new plan in place for this? Well, that's a really good question. It, it really depends on the employer, but a lot of them are taking the easy way out. And I understand that because of the administrative burden. They are essentially, uh, because this is, I mean, this is 40 hours of paid leave, but many employers that I represent are simply saying they're either creating a separate bank for the paid leave for all workers act leave and just following the statute and the proposed rules, or they're just letting people use vacation uh, and personal days uh, for this leave. And they're not asking any questions and they're, you know, <clears throat> um, just essentially administering it along with their PTO policies, or if they have separate you know, vacation and sick leave policies, like a lot of us do in Illinois to get around having to pay it all out when an employee leaves. Um, you know, I've seen it different ways. Uh, and a lot depends on, you know, how the employer is structured and, and uh, what fits best with their existing uh, leave policy. Yep, thank you. Um, thank we have you. one more question from Shane Hobb. He says, if an employer shows up late multiple times and say 10 times, but claims this leave, is there anything we can do? Uh, could you repeat that, Jerry? I'm sorry. If an employee shows up late multiple times, say 10 times, but claims this leave, is there anything we can do? Well, it depends on your timekeeping policies, but let's say you have an employee who shows up late so they're not working the, and you don't front load. So, and you're doing a cruel method only. Then that if that employee's not working the full 40 hours or a full hour to count toward the 40 hours to get leave, then, then they're, you know, they're, they don't have to give them the leave unless they work you know, a full 40 hours to get that uh, one hour of leave. So, um, yeah, I mean, the attendance policies do have a bearing on this for sure. That's a very good question. Are there any more questions? Hmm. 
All right. Well, that was great, John. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Um, and thanks to all of our participants. Yes, thank you all for joining us again um, after that mishap earlier <laughs> this month. <laughs> um, but we're we're back. All right. Um, so, yep, before we wrap up, um, I do want to mention that I did drop a, um, a HR Trends um, white paper in the chat. So please feel free to download that. Our team um, just put together, you know, a few HR trends um, that we're seeing in 2024 um, that just employers may want to um, tune into. Also, please feel free to check out our other high notes webinars on our website. Um, we have lots of things coming up and hopefully um, soon this year, we'll have John back with us with some more employment law updates. So again, Yes, thank you everyone, and um, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Zareen. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.